Hi everyone, Credit Shifu here. So, due to popular demand, i.e. your comments, we're going to be doing a video about the basics of investing in stocks and shares. So, first things first, before you put any money into the stock market, you need to have a certain amount of liquid assets, i.e. cash, that's easily available to you just in case you lose your job or fall into financial hardship. Many of the books written about investing in the stock market recommend you have six months uh, worth of your salary saved up in a savings account before you think about doing any investing. I personally go for more like three months worth of my salary in a savings account. Um, and you know, it depends on the person. If you're living at home with your parents, with them supporting you, and you just wanna do a bit of stock investing on the side and they're taking care of all your expenses, then you may not need to have any savings other than your uh, investments. The reason for this though, is when you invest, the value of your stocks and shares may go down. And you don't want to sell your shares at that time if you need money, because you'd lose money on them. You wanna wait for them to go up. Uh, but you never know when you're going to encounter financial hardship, so it's good to have several months worth of your salary saved uh, so that you don't need to touch your stock portfolio at an inconvenient time. So, now you've decided that you're going to do some investing, you need to find a brokerage. Now, I personally use Charles Schwab, it's very good, um, but there are many brokerages out there. Uh, the bank that you have an account with may also have a brokerage that you can use, and most of these brokerages now basically their interface is online. So you don't need to call up your stockbroker like in the olden days, um, you can do everything online. Um, I'll put a link to my review of the Charles Schwab account in the description below and at the end of this video for you to check out. Now, how much should you invest? Well, I would recommend that you shouldn't invest anything below $1,000, okay? If you don't have $1,000 to invest, uh, don't do it because the brokerage charges fees, um, for example, Charles Schwab, it charges uh, $4.95 uh, per trade, so to buy or to sell. If you just spend $100 on stocks, when you buy, you lose 5%, when you sell, you lose another 5%. Uh, that's 10% of your original investment that you've lost, and you'd have to make up more than 10% uh, in earnings from that if you wanted to surpass the cost of actually buying and selling. Um, so once you hit around $1,000 on a trade, you know, buying a, a stock of a company worth $1,000, uh, a fee of, you know, $4.95, basically $5 is so minimal that it doesn't really affect uh, your level of profit. Now in a minute, we're going to talk about what exactly you're going to invest in because there's not just individual shares, there are also funds, but let's first look at the two ways in which stocks and also uh, stock market indexes and various funds can make money. So the basic way that they make money is increases in value. And that's basically, if you buy a stock for say $5, and suddenly a lot of people want to buy it, um, the people selling that stock, the stock brokers can get away with selling it for higher and higher prices as demand increases. Okay, it's just like any product, if a lot of people want to buy it, just like you, you book a vacation, you book a flight in the high season, like say the summer, when everyone's going on vacation, you'll notice the prices are high, right? In the low season, let's say, you know, in the winter or something, when it's all cold, no one really wants to go there, or it's the rainy season or something, and as in the case of tropical places, they put the prices low to entice people to go on vacation in the season when no one else wants to go there. And it's the same with stocks. When a stock, when no one else wants to buy a stock, the price will be low, and when people start to want to buy it, they push the price up, and the price gets higher and higher. So that's one way in which a stock makes money, it increases in value, the price increases. And so if you bought it when it was low, and you sold it when it was high, you would make money. The other way in which stocks and shares make money is through dividends. And this is quite similar to the interest that you'd get in a bank account, although it's kind of worked out slightly differently. Um, so at the moment, bank accounts pay really minimal interest, really the best level of interest you can get in a saving, savings account at the moment in the US is about 1%. Well, stocks and shares pay dividends and the dividend rates tend to be a bit higher. Uh, they could range from anywhere from you know maybe 1% up to 3%, 5%, 6%, even up to 8%, depending on the stock, okay? And these dividends are normally paid to you uh, either annually, biannually, or quarterly. And 
the amount though is worked out per year. So say it's a 5% dividend, it's paid for you, uh, it's paid to you biannually, that's twice a year, then you get 2.5% every six months. And so that's another way that stocks earn money. So you have two ways, gains in value and the dividends. Now let's look at what to invest in. So first of all, let's talk about individual stocks. So what is a stock? Well, if I buy, let's say $1,000 worth of shares uh, in a company, let's say JP Morgan Chase, all right, it's a bank. Um, if I buy $1,000 worth of their shares, it means I own $1,000 worth of that company. And I'm entitled to the dividends that, that those shares pay. Uh, I'm entitled to voting in their shareholder uh, meeting uh, on certain things. And basically, I'm an owner of that company. Because I only own $1,000 worth, though, of a several billion dollar company, my influence over that company is very, very small. But you know, for large investors that invest, say, $100 million in Chase, they would actually have quite a lot of influence over you know, making decisions in that company. They, their vote would count for quite a lot. Um, and so, yeah, when you buy a share, the share can increase in value, and it can also pay a dividend. But it's just tied to the good or bad fortune of one company. Then we have various types of funds. So there are mutual funds which invest in a lot of different companies uh, and they're managed by a manager. Now most books these days are now recommending people not to invest in mutual funds. I personally agree with this point of view. Mutual funds are managed by a manager who takes a cut and most managers in the long term fail to beat the market. A manager may have one good year, the next year he may have a bad year. Research has shown that over a period of several years, maybe 10 years or so, these managers generally do not beat the market. Uh, so <clears throat> what I recommend is ETFs, exchange traded funds, which are actually managed by computers and they could either track an index, say the S&P 500, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, uh, which are stock markets in New York, you know, the FTSE 100 in London, or you could get a ETF that tracks a sector. For example, if you're interested in mining companies, you think mining is gonna do well this year, you put your money into mining and it'll diversify over 10 different companies, say, or 20 different companies in the mining sector, um, etc. And so an ETF is a way that you can invest in lots of different stocks uh, at the same time without necessarily shelling out a huge amount of money. So what should you buy, stocks or ETFs? Well, diversification is very important when you're setting up a stock portfolio. So if you say, I'm just gonna put all my money into one company, your whole financial future basically rests on the stability of that one company. If that company goes bankrupt, you probably lose all your money, okay? Uh, if its fortunes go down for a long time, if it stops paying a dividend, you're gonna lose out too. So it's better to diversify and invest in several different companies. I would recommend if you're investing in individual stocks, you should invest in 10 different companies, okay, at least 10, uh, in different sectors of the market. Uh, and that's to protect you from, say, one sector does badly, another sector may do well, or one company does badly, another company does well, it kind of evens out and you won't lose as much money. So considering that I advise don't invest below $1,000 in any one particular company, if you do the math, to invest in 10 companies, you would need $10,000 to start your portfolio. This might not be possible for you, and that's where ETFs come in really handy for the smaller investor. Uh, you can invest $1,000 in an ETF and bam, you own shares in possibly 20 or 30 different companies. This helps to spread your risk. If you say have $5,000, you may wanna put $3,000 into three different ETFs, and then you may wanna try your chances with a couple of individual companies uh, just to see how you do. But you have that stability there provided by ETFs um, that sort of diversifies your risk. Now let's look at how to pick a stock, or potentially an ETF as well, but really this information pertains mostly to stocks. There's something called the P-E ratio, which is the price versus earnings ratio. And what this means um, is how much more expensive the stock is compared to the amount of profit the company is earning. So the average P-E ratio in the market right now is about 20 to 25. Now what this means is that the price of one share in that company is around 20 to 25 times the amount of profit per share that that company makes in a year. Let's look at an example. This is the graph and information for Rio Tinto PLC. It's a mining company that I own shares in. Uh, it's based in London with mining operations all over the world. 
Um, I actually buy it on the New York Stock Exchange, which is why the price is denominated in dollars. If you look at the PE ratio, it's 15.36, so a little bit under the average for the market. That means shares are only 15 times uh, more expensive than the annual profit. Um, so this would be considered a low PE ratio. But if you have a look at the graph, uh, the current share price is actually below the five-year average. If the share price increased, uh, the PE ratio uh, would increase as well. And probably coming around, getting reaching around the average over five years, uh, you may get somewhere close to the average for the market, which is around 20 to 25 PE ratio. Now, having a high PE ratio could mean a couple of things. It could mean that a lot of people are buying the stock, driving the price up, because they think that the company is going to have a turn of fortune and it's going to start earning a lot of money in the future, okay? Uh, and that could happen, that could be true. Or they could be foolishly driving the price up and the company could be overvalued, um, which could mean that its stock price could crash in the near future. A low PE ratio uh, would mean that the company is earning a lot of profit compared to the share price, just like Rio Tinto right now, it's, you know, a little bit low. Um, but, you know, this could mean, you could ask yourself, why is it low? Have I discovered some really good deal, a, a little gem that no one else knows about? No, it could mean that there are not that good prospects for the company to increase its profits or increase in value, so there's not that much interest in buying the shares right now, which means, which is why the price isn't being driven up and the PE ratio stands at that level. And with Rio Tinto, actually that's true. Demand is down in China, it has big stockpiles of iron ore, etc. Um, so yeah, the immediate prospect for it to increase its price and its, uh, its earnings are not that high, which is why the PE ratio is low and the stock price is perhaps not increasing uh, as quickly as it could. But then we could always be wrong. Uh, you could really have found an undervalued company. Um, although as a beginner and someone who's not doing this full time, it's probably unlikely uh, that you would do that. And my experience and my advice would be just to stick with a PE ratio somewhere around the average, like in the high teens, uh, don't go too high above 30 because that means that the company probably won't grow that much because it's already kind of getting overvalued. So, you know, stick reasonably close to the average unless you are someone who's a real professional doing a lot of research. To give you uh, an example of how high PE ratios can go. In the year 2000, the NASDAQ, uh, which is an index of technology stocks, uh, crashed when the dot-com bubble burst. Now, the PE ratio for the NASDAQ was 175. Now, indexes and funds, etc., can have PE ratios as well, but they won't generally appear uh, in the information provided on your uh, stockbroker or your, your brokerage's you know, online interface, you have to go directly to the website of the, the fund to try and find out about it, and it's not as accurate. Anyway, at the time, analysts had worked out that the NASDAQ overall, all the companies, all the technology companies, um, had a PE ratio together of 175, and the highest point the NASDAQ hit was 5,000 points, and then it crashed. It took 15 years to get back up above uh, 5,000. So from the year 2000 to the year 2015, it took 15 years to recover. And now the NASDAQ's PE ratio overall is at about 32. So it's nowhere near as overvalued as it was in 2000. It's much more stable, which leads us to think that there will not be a huge crash, a huge bubble like there was in the year 2000 with these ridiculously overvalued companies. And many of these companies did not recover. They just went bust uh, and people lost their money. So that's how important it is to pay attention to PE ratio. It's a very good indicator uh, of whether a stock is over or undervalued. And if you see a PE ratio of NA, not applicable, that means the company's making a loss. So uh, they're not making any money. You may consider not wanting to invest in that company. Uh, but it's not absolute. You know, if you're, if you're buying low, uh, selling high, uh, the share price may be low and it may be very likely that you know if it's a very trusted stable company that will get back into profit in the future so you may consider buying it anyway um, but this is not something i can necessarily advise you on everyone has their own strategy and speaking of strategy let's now look at a few investing strategies so the most basic thing in investing in the stock market is to buy low and sell high okay and it sounds simple but in reality when you're dealing with the sort of psychological pressure 
of uh, risking losing your money, people get a bit weird mentally and often fall into the trap of doing the opposite, buying high, selling low. They see, wow, the stocks are increasing in price really fast. They're going really high. I'm sure they'll go higher. Let me buy now. So they buy. Trouble is the stocks don't go much higher and then they drop. And then the people worry, whoa, the, the price has dropped so much. How low is it going to go? I might as well cut my losses and get out now. And they sell at a loss. But actually, they could have just waited. They might have to wait one or two years, but the price will go up above the price they bought it for and they will make a profit. So in order to buy low, sell high, you need to be in the market. You need to have a position in the market before the stock prices increase. Um, and you need to hold your nerve. You need to wait until you think it really is the top. Maybe not quite the top because then you risk just getting over the top and starting to go down before you can sell. But you know, once you've made a sizable profit and you, if you want to sell, you can. Of course, you don't have to sell. Uh, you can continue to hold those stocks through ups and downs. Uh, and that's basically our next strategy, which is buy and hold, which is kind of Warren Buffett's strategy. He buys stocks and he holds them for a very long time. Uh, it doesn't mean that he holds them forever. Uh, there are a few stocks that he says he'll never sell, like Coca-Cola. He, In his opinion, it's such a stable company that he will never sell it. And if you look at their graph over time, they do grow very steadily, obviously through ups and downs, but steadily growing. Uh, and then he does rebalance his portfolio from time to time. Recently, he's been investing in airlines, which, you know, I, I think he he believes that they're going to do well in the in the sort of medium term, probably medium to long term future. Uh, so he's putting his money in that. So the buy and hold strategy for the average investor, uh, generally, you'll reinvest the dividend to get the most value out of this strategy. And when you reinvest your dividend, you benefit from something called compound interest. And that's similar to interest on a bank account. So here's an example. Let's say I invest $100 uh, with a dividend of 5% annually. Um, after the first year, I'll have $105. That becomes my new base amount, which my interest is then added to. Um, so the following year, 5% of $105 is $5.25. So the next year, my total in my account will be $110.25. Okay, and it increases more and more each year, and you get this exponential increase. So you can see on the left hand side, when it's just numbers, it doesn't look that clear. But when we put it into a graph, you can see there's a definite curve, an exponential increase. It grows slowly at the start and then starts increasing and increasing, increasing in speed. Um, it takes you 16 years to double your money, okay, to earn another hundred dollars. But to double your initial investment again, okay, to earn another hundred dollars, it only takes nine years. Uh, and then after that, it will take less and less time. Uh, eventually, your money will be growing at a very, very fast speed. Now, think about, we're just doing this example with a hundred dollars. If you did this example with, say, ten thousand uh, dollars, after 25 years, you'd have over thirty thousand dollars. And that's just the dividends. Don't forget your stocks and shares will grow in value too as the price increases. So you're actually gonna grow even faster than what I have down here. If you're reinvesting your dividends, you'll also benefit from something called dollar cost averaging. While you're just constantly buying the shares by reinvesting your dividends every quarter or every half year or whatever, um, the market will be going up and down. So sometimes you'll be buying at a high price and sometimes you'll be buying at a low price. It will average out. So in the end, you actually find that you're buying your shares at a medium price. You're always getting a reasonable deal. It's not the highest, it's not the lowest, but you're getting reasonable value uh, for the price you're buying your shares at. And that's called dollar cost averaging. And this kind of thing, buy and hold, relying on compound interest, dollar cost averaging is a great uh, strategy for someone who just wants to set their portfolio up and not pay too much attention to it, not actively manage it, just let it grow. Um, there are also some other ways for more active management of your portfolio. I wouldn't necessarily recommend these things to beginners, but I will go over them briefly. Uh, speculating on sudden price increases in either the overall market or certain stocks. Um, so there are certain events that cause instability. For example, elections are one, war, certain other things. Uh, when we had the election uh, last year in the US between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, 
the stock market became quite unstable before the election started to go down and hit you know a low level um, sort of the day before the election but as it became apparent that Trump had won the following morning stocks started to rocket up they really increased very very quickly and by early 2017, the Dow Jones had broken through the 20,000 point mark, which it had never done before and has been hitting highs every day uh, since. Now, Warren Buffett said that the stock market would rise, whether it was Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. And that is true to some extent. Uh, but generally, when a Republican government takes over, or in the UK, when a conservative government takes over, the stock market uh, has a sharp rise straight away because the policies of those two types of government, the more right-wing policies, are favorable to business. They generally tax lower. Um, if Hillary Clinton had won, uh, like B Warren Buffett said, he thinks the stock market still would have gone up. I agree with him. I think it would have gone up. But you probably wouldn't have seen the sudden rise. It probably would have gone up more slow and steady pace. I'll give you another example of buying stocks based on negative information. Recently, the president, Donald Trump, uh, he loves Twitter. And he recently tweeted about a couple of companies, um, actually at the end of last year. So first he tweeted about Boeing, uh, saying that Air Force One, the new replacement for Air Force One, was too expensive. Uh, cancel the order. And he immediately caused um, Boeing's stock price to drop. But sure enough, you know, there was no real negative information about the company. And it was only one order. It was just people panicked and sold their shares, right? The price went back up. Many people took advantage of the low price. I saw this effect. I didn't buy it uh, that time. But later on, President Trump also tweeted uh, about Lockheed Martin, saying the F-35 was too expensive. It again caused Lockheed's share price to drop straight away. This time, after seeing what happened with Boeing, I was straight in there. I bought it and I waited a few months and I sold it. I think I got about a 7% uh, profit. It was a, that's a reasonable profit on a a investment of about a thousand dollars I made about seventy dollars but I don't do this with the main part of my portfolio I just have a small fund where I do this kind of thing because it's kind of risky and it verges on not really being investing anymore it's more like trading and the most sort of extreme form of that is day trading where you're buying stocks and selling them really the same day or within a couple of days basically relying on the gains and losses that they have within one day um, I wouldn't really recommend this for beginners, so I'm not really going to talk about it. And this video is called uh, Investing in Stocks and Shares, not Trading in Stocks and Shares. Um, but I'm just going to let you know it's out there. So guys, thanks so much for watching this video. Please leave your comments below and let me know what aspects you want to hear explained in more detail because this was just a very introductory video to introduce uh, some of the concepts, etc. Um, but we could go into far more detail uh, on many of these things. And I'll just recap a little bit. So for beginners uh, or people with small amounts of money to invest, ETFs are your friend because of the diversification. Um, if you have a bit more money, you can start picking individual stocks. PE ratio is a great way of looking at the health of a company, uh, especially if you don't have that much time to research into other aspects of it. Um, it is all very complicated, so for people who don't have a lot of time to research and manage their portfolio, I would just recommend a buy and hold strategy and reinvesting your dividends. Um, okay, guys, thanks for watching. As always, I'm the Credit Shivu. Please subscribe to our channel for more videos like this, and we'll see you next time. Bye.